Hello Formula One Entity Car fans, today is June 4, 2020. Anxious for some racing to start soon? I know I am, and we will get it soon enough, but before I begin with any racing news, I'd like to tell you something interesting about these two cars here. And to think, they're in their prime, they were victorious in the year 1955. 1955? Great Scott! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't resist using that joke for you Back to the Future fans. And it's a good thing what I'm, about to, what I'm about to tell you between these two cars here occurred in 1955, for those who don't know, because if they didn't, for you Back to the Future fans, would you know what that would mean? It means that this damn joke wouldn't work at all! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know, I just, I couldn't help it, I love Back to the Future as well, but then almost anything that involves cars and such. Well, anyway, now to get on to business, and why do I talk 1955, other than the fact that, in fact, this year is 65 years from that year, naturally. To begin with, on May 30th, 1955, this um, Curtis Craft, powered by an Offenhauser engine, which was mechaniced by A.J. Watson, was driven to victory at the 1955 Indianapolis 500 by the late Bob Swigert. And what a race it turned out to be. But tragic for um, former winner Billy Vukovic, who was trying to go for a third in a row, a feat that has never been accomplished at Indianapolis so far. Back-to-back -back victories in 53 and 4 uh, Bill Vukovic had obtained, yes, but he was never able to be, make it a third in a row as he was killed during the race on the backstretch. And interestingly enough, five days after the race was when my late grandparents got married. Which can only mean one thing. Happy 65th wedding anniversary, Grandma and Grandpa, wherever you are. I miss you very much, and um, if you're watching this video, I hope you like these fun facts about your wedding year. When my grandparents' um, wedding uh, marriage was only one week old, on June 11, 1955, this Jaguar D-Type, driven to victory at the 24 Hours of Le Mans by Mike Hawthorne and Ivor Webb, was when it was in its prime. And as some of you Le Mans historians would know, that that was a day marred with the tragic deaths of over 80 spectators, and uh, Pierre Levesque in a Mercedes that um, a lot of people have blamed Mike Hawthorne for driving his Jaguar, cutting him off and making him lose control and flying to the grandstands for. You can imagine disgustingly sickening um, the uh, mess it created and probably with the blackest day in motorsport racing, almost comparable with the 1973 Indy 500, but that's a story for another time. With that said, even though the, the car took victory, you can imagine the uh, celebration was pretty shallow. Hopefully Bob, even though he would, might have known about uh, Bill Vukovic, um, what happened during the race, Hopefully his celebration was a lot brighter, but it just goes to show that racing will never be completely safe no matter how much they raise the bar. It'll keep some people safe depending on how you put it, but sometimes it just goes to show that keep improving, but it will never be completely safe. But what we have done, what those aero screens will prove for the Indy cars um, this Saturday in Texas, we're about to soon see their potential and how they can keep drivers safe. If I said in my uh, last video that on NBC the Indy car um, starts at uh, 7 p.m. on Saturday night on June 6th, my mistake. It's actually 8 o'clock, not 7. So tune in to NBC, not NBC Sports Network, but the network channel itself, NBC. And as he used to say in the 80s, let's all be there. One thing I know is the fact that um, what they're going to do at the Texas race is try to, like, have the drivers go out for no more than 35 laps on one tire stint. So, some people say it's frustrating for them as they need to test the tires out. But hey, what goes around comes around. And I'm sure the frustrations to hear about are very tiring. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Interestingly enough, in other news, Tony Kanan will be back with his old sponsor, 7-Eleven, even though he's driving number 14 because of A.J. Foyt Racing. Because 
From 2003 to 2010, Tony Kanaan had 7-Eleven be his primary sponsor for the Andretti Autosport and gave the team its first victory in Phoenix in 2003. While true, he never won the Indy 500 with uh, 7-Eleven, it's definitely a great feeling for Tony Kanaan in his final season to be driving 7-Eleven, at least in the Texas round, because that's where the stuff is based, Texas. And 14 of his IndyCar career wins have come, have come with 7-Eleven's sponsor. Good luck um, this Saturday, Tony, if you're watching this, and um, we'll see what happens. With that said, boy, am I thirsty and hungry. Oh, thank heaven. I'll be cheering you on once again, Tony, as I wear your 2013 jersey for when you won Indy in 2013. And we'll see how you do at Indy. Will you have the 7-Eleven sponsor for the Indy 500? We'll soon find out when we reach August, assuming this COVID-19 thing can get under control. Well, that's all for now. Tune in June 6th at 8 o'clock on NBC for the Indy cars to take place in Texas. And we'll see who comes out on top. So gather yourself some Texas toast as well to celebrate where the cars go down in Texas Motor Speedway. And until in my next video, I'll talk of some Formula One news as well, as well as the outcome of the race. Good luck to all IndyCar fans, um, good luck to all IndyCar drivers, Tony Kanaan especially, for supporting Texas. I'm Aaron Cylinder, firing on all cylinders.